We've talked about this night as legacy night. The gentleman that I'm going to introduce has a legacy of service and a legacy of sacrifice. Sergeant First Class Gregory A. Stubbe from Covington, Tennessee, was very seriously wounded during Operation Medusa in Afghanistan, September of 2006. His fighting vehicle moved up a hill and was hit by an IED, seriously wounding Stubbe. Focusing on his wounds and pull, pulling from his Special Forces medical training, Stubbe guided other Special Forces A-team members in combat trauma care until he was moved out of danger. Greg began his Special Forces career when he volunteered and completed the Special Forces Assessment and Selection in 1992 at the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. He graduated the Special, Warfare, Special Forces Qualification Course as a Special Forces Medical Sergeant. His medical training includes extensive trauma management, sur surgery, anesthesia, orthopedics, pediatrics, pharmacology, and the list goes on. He is a decorated American soldier. His awards include the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, multiple Army Accommodation Medals, multiple Army Achievement Medals, the Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, you heard his inspiring speech. And it was one of the most incredible presentations I think this organization has ever heard. And it challenged us to give. Greg made a couple of comments. One of his first was that, geez, he thought it was kind of wild. He was out there in Reno, Nevada, and he's not a sheep hunter. Well, because of the generosity of one of our members, and Greg will tell you, he is now. And Greg wears one of these kicked out of the less than one club pins. Greg also made one other comment that I thought was uh, pretty incredible. As he saw what we did, he saw the money that we raised. I think he even lived through our blackout. And he saw you all stay there till 1 a.m and sell those tags and raise money for wild sheep. He said, you know what? The Wild Sheep Foundation membership are the special forces of the hunting and conservation community. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a extreme honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Sergeant First Class Retired, Greg Stubbe. What a man. Sit down. We've done this before. I can't believe I'm back. I can't believe I'm back in these conditions because my life has changed. I don't know what's happened for you, but a whole lot's happened for me. I'm excited about the opportunity to tell you about it because you deserve to know. First of all, I can't assume a position at any microphone with anybody listening to me without saying, God bless America. <laughs> and I want to give you the opportunity to terminate this speaking engagement right now by telling you I'm an unapologetic Christian. If you have issues, <laughs> some folks just don't get it. Now, I've heard that it's good to start off with a joke, and I've never done it before. Never started with a joke before, especially one that uses foul language. Do I have your permission to use one curse word? Okay. So there's this 10-year-old girl on an airplane, and she's riding next to an atheist. An atheist says to the 10-year-old girl who's reading her Bible, he says, hey, little girl, you know, these flights go a lot quicker if you just strike up some conversation. And the little girl says, well, what would we talk about, sir? 
He says, well, for starters, I could tell you why there is no God. The little girl looks a little confused, and she closes her Bible. She says, well, sir, if I can ask you one question first, that, that'd be nice. He said, well, okay, shoot. She says, now, sir, you've got deer and horses and cows, and they might all eat from exactly the same grass and the same pasture. But when they go to the bathroom, it looks different. The deer, you know, he drops little pellets. A horse drops apples. And a cow, well, he makes pies. Sir, can you tell me why that is? And he just looks all perplexed. Uh, little girl, I don't know why you're asking me about this, but no, I, I don't have an answer for that. She says, well, if you don't know shit, how are you supposed to tell me about God? <laughs> So here we are, and the last time I was here, I stood up here and I tried to tell you why the, the service that I've done for this nation is very small, but the service that we all give in so many capacities as one team makes it great. And, and I'll tell you, first of all, I don't believe that service is a concept that's owned by anyone in uniform, period. It's just not. That's not where service begins. Some would say service begins with our creator. You know, some would say service begins with your mommy because she's truly serving you while you're serving yourself. And it starts when we're infants and we can't even feed ourselves. Our mothers are the ones who really care. So service, I think, is, is an inalienable part of our culture. We just can't get rid of it. It's here to stay. And I know it's here at the Wild Sheep Foundation and that's why it was so important to me to be here, even though I wasn't a sheep hunter. Because I felt like we had a real kinship. I felt, I felt like we really had an alliance and a unity within the guardianship of freedom itself, natural resources, and our natural world around us. I mean, who else goes around talking with tears in their eyes about... I just want to put one more sheep on that mountain. <laughs> Who does that? And why is it so compelling? Why is it so important to you people? You got some issues. <laughs> and now that I've been on a sheep hunt, <laughs> yeah, you're not quite right, people. <laughs> I don't know why you do what you do, uh, but you do it. And I want to talk about it. A little bit of adventure happened after I left this event. Uh, now, I want to start off with context, but I don't want to make it all about me. I want, to, I want to keep this big picture here, but I want you to know who it is that went on a sheep hunt and a coos deer hunt as a result of this. Can I, can I get some pictures up here? I don't want to ruin anybody's dinner, but that's you know, some good prime rib. Next. Next. Gunshot wounds, third degree burns. My intestines fell out that hole. And my right leg was severed below the knee. And all kinds of other good stuff. Next. But it was all okay, because I got to come home. Next. I came home to my little turd named Gregory. <laughs> Next. And that's the family. That's the family unity that stuck together. And you look at it, look at his shirts. I'm wearing a, a t-shirt with a deer on it. My son's wearing one with a bear on it. You could tell what we had in mind even when I was confined to a wheelchair. We really loved being outside together as a family the whole time. I didn't know what I'd ever be able to do again, though. And when I was here two years ago, I was still strictly forbidden from doing anything crazy like hunting a sheep somewhere up on the moon. And that's where he was, I promise. Where's my guide? Rob, where you at? Was he on the moon or what? Tell a good story. So there we were. First, I went on a coos deer hunt. And the generosity of this group of people, just you, you crazy folks, decided that because I hadn't been on a sheep hunt before and you felt that, that kinship 
with that guardian spirit, you know, the way we defend this country and defend our natural, re natural resources, it's, it's just a natural fit. So you sent me all expenses paid on a coos deer hunt. And then you assisted Ron and Marla Shower um, and sent me on a sheep hunt also. And the magnitude of this, it went far beyond what I could have possibly comprehended. And that's what I want to talk about tonight because I had obstacles and I had barriers. And as a 23-year active duty guy in the special forces, you know, I was a green beret. I got to be the tough guy, right? I, I thought that I could handle everything and I thought I was ready for anything. But you introduced me to a new set of circumstances and I had to buck up like a good little brunt to make it through. And I wasn't sure I'd make it home all right, but I did. Now, some of the, some of the revelation that I came across in this, first I knew when I, when I went with Dan Adler on a coos deer hunt and it was hot outside and we were walking through rocks that looked like uh, lava rocks and everything and everything was like a 16 inch softball. You couldn't step anywhere without rolling on them and falling and breaking your neck. It was about, I don't know, 150 miles of that. But we made it, and we got a coos deer. And with the help of these guys, they, they acted somehow like it was more important to them to get that coos deer than it was to me. And, and I didn't understand it. Why? <laughs> Why would it be so important? Why would they be so compelled to help me? Why would Ron and Marlis Shower go out into the middle of nowhere with no running water, go into an outhouse each day to stay in camp for a week and a half just simply to support me on my hunt, just to be there after they paid for it? Why would they do that? It concerned me, and it, it, what a heavy burden that was on my heart. I think I understand now a little better why. And as I hung out with Ron, and, and if you, who knows Ron Shower? I told him to wear his flak vest tonight. This man is, he's not always real personal. And, and he's definitely not emotional. So, so if I'm going to share some, some of what I'm feeling inside, I better talk to Marlis. But let me tell you something, he defied everything I'd seen about his character so far. When each time I approached camp, it didn't matter whether, whether it was by boat, helicopter, bleeding feet, it didn't matter. That man was standing outside in the cold, waiting for me like, like my own grandfather would, like my own dad would. And he was so eager to hear the details and he was so concerned about my well-being and he wanted this success to a degree that I couldn't measure. And I just want to say thank you for that. I want to say thank you, uh, not only to Ron and Marlis, but to everyone here that shares that kind of compassion. Um, but what I'm concerned about is sympathy, because I never wanted sympathy. In fact, my dad told me where to find sympathy. And it, it was in my Funkin' Wagonals, he said somewhere between shit and syphilis. <laughs> That's where I was supposed to find sympathy should I decide I wanted it. So I kind of learned to avoid that. And, and for me, as one, one soldier getting hurt, I don't think I should be getting any credit. I don't think anybody should be showering me with all this respect because I forgot to duck. <laughs> Period. <laughs> And it's, I mean, and, and we can laugh about that, but, but the honest truth is the guys who really deserve your admiration and your respect, they're the ones that didn't tap out early like I did. They're the ones who have been going back over and over and over again. And when they get home, they don't get hunting trips and fishing trips. They get a honeydew list a mile long. 
And, and, and they fulfill their duties as citizens and soldiers at home and garrison. They do everything that they're expected to do as citizens, soldiers, fathers, husbands. And what do they get for it? They get to go back again and risk their lives. And this time they might not come home. And so what we're left with is a scenario where we haven't thanked exactly the right people. Because the ones who gave the most, they were giving until the moment they died. And now we don't have a chance. Now we can't have that unity with them. And so I want to tell you for myself, I think we need to reshape how we feel about veterans in this country. It is not that veterans need more attention. No, it is not. In fact, what I want to say is that, sure, soldiers are important, but we're an island of misfit toys that volunteered. So we cannot be victims if we volunteered. And I don't want to offend anybody. I didn't join the French army. I joined the American army. And I anticipated a fight. No offense, anybody, I, I mean it. I just know the track record of this country. And it, <laughs> there's going to be a fight. I'm sorry. And so I didn't go into it blind, you know, not knowing what could happen. And so it's impossible for me to be a victim. Rather, I'm a volunteer. Now, onto the wounded stuff. And if I'm ruffling feathers, it's okay. If you saw the pictures, I'm one of the people that's supposed to be wounded. But let me tell you something. After a sheep hunt, I've changed my perspective. If you call me wounded, you're crazy. You're nuts. Because you weren't there to see what I did. And you're not there in the lives of these people to see how they're soldiering on to do all that they do. You see, wounded is not a destination. Wounded should never become a person's identity. I mean, what, what are we going for if we accept that? We can't. And so I'd rather the simple identity of being a warrior, right? Isn't that enough? Now, if, if we believe in this, and, I, and there's a part of the reason I'm, I'm saying this tonight is because I want to empower you. If you have not served in the military or you, if you have not fought in combat, I take issue with your humility. I take issue with the fact that you won't speak up about these issues because you don't feel like you're authorized or you don't feel like you've earned it. No, you're as much a part of the team as anyone else. And in this country... Military veterans, beginning with George Washington, have been an institution for leadership in this country. I mean, it's undeniable. You look what, what soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen have done when they came back with whatever they had left. We've got examples all the way through our history. Now, why all of a sudden are we becoming an entitlement class? Why are you not insisting that I do more? Why are you not telling me, hey, what you learned on that battlefield, man, that's some serious stuff that nobody else gets. You're dealing with leadership effects and capabilities that, that a lot of us can't even fathom. You know, when I go to get the onion rings at Burger King, nobody's shooting at me, bro. And it's not that I want to make the world military. I sure do not. But I think that there's something to be gained through those experiences when you're willing and able to overcome your own fear of dying to accomplish even small tasks. But I see that kind of commitment in this room. And when I tried to follow Rob on my hunt at McKenzie Mountain Outfitters, ever heard of him? That boy was stupid. You know, that Green Beret didn't mean anything out there. My Special Forces experience negotiating all this terrain and facing enemies all over the place. I never faced an enemy that was half as smart as a sheep. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I'll tell you what, <laughs> I ain't scared of Taliban, but give a sheep a gun and I'm staying home. 
<laughs> it was something else out there because I was going places I'd never been. I was dealing with physical adversity. I was dealing with physical challenges that were as hard as anything I had ever done in special operations. I was dealing with wounds and injuries that, that physically made me feel like I could not get to where those sheep were. And I found out out there that, that I had limitations that I hadn't recognized or identified yet. And they were psychological. Psychological limitations, and I'd have called you a liar for calling me enough of a sissy to have psychological barriers. But it's true. I was afraid of what might happen on the other side of that physical exertion, that fatigue, everything that you go through out there. And I, oh, I don't even want to. I actually did that. <laughs> and, and part of the problem for me was that I'm thinking a whole lot in life has come pretty well and pretty easy for me. You know, even all things considered, spending that time in the hospital dealing with that, things worked out for me pretty well. And when, I, when they flew me in on a chopper, and I'm thinking, wow, this is beautiful. We can't lose. We walk 500 yards into the first draw, and we're looking up for a great place to camp that evening, and we see four rams coming straight towards us. And, and we hide behind a rock, and we're watching these rams come. And I don't know the deal. I'm getting my gun ready. And my guide looks at me, and he's a young cat, young guy. He says, oh, oh no, 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 no. Don't even put a bullet in that gun. I'm like, what are you talking about? Is that, that's a doll sheep. He said, no, brother, no, 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 no. 12 hours before we can even look for a sheep. Are you kidding me? What? What? So it was a do-over from the start. Had them in my sights, had everything lined up, and then I had to earn it. Yep, I had to earn it because each day it seemed like a 16-mile trek up the side of a hill to get to the tree line where you might get an opportunity for a final approach if you didn't put your bright blue tent in the open where the sheep could see it. And then they run over to the other side of the moon and there's not even any light over there. So it was one strike after another, and it was mostly mistakes and hardships on my part. And poor Rob, you know, the kids is physical and capable, and I know all of you are that do this. And I thought that I was slowing him down. I thought that, that I was cramping his style. And so I barked at him a little bit. I, I was frustrated at my own limitations. I was frustrated because I couldn't have kept up with him if I, if I had to. And I barked at him. I said, I bet you feel good that you can walk that fast out here. I hope you're real proud of yourself. Because I'm back here struggling, bro. And a tear ran down his face. And he said, you should have had two sheep by now. You, you've, you've done everything right. And it's my job to get you a sheep and I feel like I'm failing. And I just, I can't stand it. So as long as you can go, I'm going to do everything I can for you. And when he said that, it, first of all, it made me look like the real jerk I am. And, and then I realized how bad he wanted that sheep. He wanted me to have that. And I, and I thought, what a servant heart and a warrior spirit to get through that. And so, Rob, I thank you so much for that. Uh, you got me through the tough times out there. And I started having internal bleeding, and I know what that's about, and I'm thinking, do we need the Iridium phone now? You know, do I really need to call for the chopper now? And I was holding off and holding off, waiting to go unconscious, <laughs> praying for death. <laughs> you know what sheep hunters do. But I wound up being inspired and educated out there. And I found out 
about more of my limitations. And I want you to know I came out of there in far better condition than I went in. And since then, I feel unstoppable. There's nothing I can't do. There's not much I won't do. And I feel great about that, to come from, from where I was feeling wounded to recognize and I've got more capabilities than I ever dreamt possible. And you sheep hunters are responsible for that. <clears throat> there was something bigger and deeper out there, though, that I, I need to share with you. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to offend anybody, but most of you people have money. And I, okay, fine, get mad. But we've, we've got class delineations in, in this country and around the world, and we've got socioeconomic considerations for how we live and, and how we perceive everything. And I had never imagined that I had it wrong because I never felt like a victim. I had a really good life. But the first time I came to the WSF convention, I thought, man, these are sheep hunters because they obviously are successful and often wealthy because it takes that to hunt sheep. And tonight, I want to confess to you my sincere, well, I apologize. Because it was that old how the other half lives kind of fallacy that I was believing in. And I'd fallen prey to what goes on in the media and, and what I see and hear from people around me in all walks of life. I'm out on this sheep hunt thinking about the man who's sitting in camp with his wife who paid for my opportunity to hunt sheep. And I remember conversations on the way in. Now, I'm at the real suffering point. And I remember Ron Shower saying that he had more than two grand slams. And it was the first time I thought, this has nothing to do with money. Not a thing. Because if that man back at camp did these things that I'm having to do to get even near a sheep, I had it all backwards. He wasn't a sheep hunter because he had money. He was successful because he was a sheep hunter. If you have it in your heart, if you have it in your mind and in your belly, if you've got the drive and the confidence, the wherewithal, if you've got anything of what it takes to succeed and you won't stop at anything until you get there, I bet you're a sheep hunter. And those are the same things it takes to be successful in life. And those are the same things that make freedom work because I believe that capitalism is the key to our success as a free society and a free nation. And so I want you to know that, that you have vast opportunities here to build bridges and to change the future of this country. You can change these divisions. You, you can redefine things through your outreach here at the Wild Sheep Foundation. Because each hunter that you take out there to experience this, each future sheep hunter and conservationist, and they're inseparable, those two are one. If you can do that with new people as an outreach, I want you to know it's not just one for one because the people that will be successful on a sheep hunt are the same people that are gonna be successful in life and in business. And so you're creating an ambassadorship that is tenfold what the average organization could do. You're not dealing with the average person here. And I submit to you, you sheep hunters, and especially you guides, you sick people, <laughs> I wish that we could sample your DNA and identify what the strain is because the Department of Defense could really use it.
I overestimated myself as a Green Beret. Now I know that we truly are one team, and it is one fight. I'm a sheep hunter now, and I'm so proud of that. <laughs> but it's not enough to understand. We have to do something about it. We have to take that step. And I don't want to sugarcoat anything, and I sure don't want to offend anybody. Right? <laughs> but I want to guilt you in any way possible to giving as much as you possibly can tonight. I don't gain anything from it, but my son might. This is good for all of us. This, this is the future. And if you're standing around a campfire complaining about how things are going, that our culture isn't the same as it used to be, well, look at yourself. What's the example that you're making? With me, you've made a great one. Now, I want to help you to make more examples. And I personally, I don't know what the future holds for me. I know I, I retired from 23 years, but I sure ain't done working after seeing this because I have my own goal now. I will, mark my words, put one back on the mountain. Please help me, help my son. Be like Ron and Marla Shower. Be like Dan Adler, and I know you already are. Shower the world with the kind of love you feel for the world around you and for the conservation of these natural resources. These are experiences that make people richer no matter what walk of life they're from. You're holding the keys. You used them on me, and you changed my life out there, and I thank you for that. Don't hold back tonight. Give it everything you can. And by all means, if you all don't call on me as a servant in the future to do anything, I don't care if you need the floor mopped. You're wrong. Let me help. And expect more from all veterans. If, if our leadership institution of veterans turns into an entitlement class, then our country's in trouble. I know that I could do more now. Expect it of me. God bless you all, and God bless America. I don't really have any words that I can say after listening to that presentation other than just a few. Greg, you are a sheep hunter now, and you've been kicked out of the Lesson One Club. Incredible. Greg Stubbe.